Welcome to the science plenary session, Inherited Retinal Disease Genetics, Testing, and Registries. Um, this session, it'll last about 65 minutes, and we will reserve about 20 minutes for questions again. Please note the uh, session is being audio recorded, and if you're using an assisted listening device, please turn to channel red. Just check with my AV that, that I got that right. Um, and don't forget to silence your cell phone. Uh, the speakers for this session is Dr. Todd Durham, uh, Ms. Christy Lee, and Dr. Romero Maldonado. Dr. Durham is the Senior Vice President of Clinical and Outcome Research at the Foundation Fighting Blindness. In his current role, he's responsible for directing the Foundation's Clinical Consortium of Retinal Experts, managing the Foundation's Disease Registry, developing strategies to enhance product development, partnering with industry, and providing technical input on partner programs and investment decisions. Ms. Christy Lee is a certified genetic counselor and a research professor in the Department of Genetics at University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Ms. Lee received her uh, degree from North Carolina State University and um, her master's degree in genetic counseling from the University of North Carolina at uh, Greensboro. And she is um, active, the president of the, the, the Raleigh Vision chapter. It's just former president. Okay. Okay, former president, but she has been involved and engaged um, in the chapter, and we thank her for that. Uh, Dr. Maldonado is a distinguished ophthalmologist specializing in medical retina, ophthalmic genetics, and electrophysiology. As a faculty member at Duke University Eye Center, uh, Dr. Maldonado serves as the director of the Inherited Retinal Disease Fellowship and co-director of the Center for Ophthalmic Genetics. Before we begin, I'd like to encourage you all to continue to be social with us so you can follow the Visions conversation on Thread, Instagram, Facebook. Um, and when you share your experience on social, please tag us. So hashtag Vision 2024 or at Fighting Blindness. I would like to now turn the floor over to our first speaker, Dr. Maldonado. You take it from here or it's up to you. Either. Yeah, okay, well, uh, thank you very much, everyone, for being here and to the organizers for this invitation. Uh, we're going to have a nice conversation about genetic testing, and uh, I hope this is very dynamic. So I'm going to start mentioning a couple of things that are very important about genetic testing because it has really changed. Uh, many things in the field. And um, one of the uh, aspects that it has changed is that it has changed the name that we give to many of the diseases. Mm. For example, uh, there, there was a term of pattern dystrophy that we used to give in, uh, to patients when there was a, some pigment changes in the macula. But nowadays with genetic testing, we name it uh, uh, based on the genes. So for example, it will be uh, PRPH2 maculopathy. In the same way, for example, nowadays, uh, when I chart, uh, when I do my records, I no longer say retinitis pigmentosa only, but I name the type of retinitis pigmentosa based on the gene. So I would say retinitis pigmentosa associated to the rhodopsin gene, for example. So this uh, new level of definition of these inherited eye diseases, it's certainly thanks to uh, genetic testing. Uh, but number two, there are other conditions that can look like uh, inherited retinal diseases, and uh, we can only rely on genetic testing to be able to make these conclusions, to know if it's inherited or something else. For example, I have had patients with a long history of inflammation, 
uh, related to sarcoid, which is a condition that can affect the retina and create pigment. And many years after, it can look like retinitis pigmentosa, for example. Uh, but thanks to genetic testing and other laboratory tests, we can get into a more precise definition of the patient's condition. So all these aspects are changing with genetic testing. And uh, there are other examples that come to my mind, and Christy may elaborate more in the syndromic conditions, but I do remember a patient of mine that um, came to me with many years of a diagnosis of retinitis pigmentosa. And uh, after evaluating the patient, I noticed that there was a syndromic component. There was more than the retina there. And uh, I noticed that the patient had some special uh, facial features. And by talking to the patient, uh, this patient has had a a history of uh, doing poorly in school, not doing well in her relationships with other people. And uh, when doing genetic testing, uh, we discover a change in a gene that explains Cohen syndrome, which is associated with retinitis pigmentosa, abnormal facial features, but also developmental delay. And when I explained to the patient that this final diagnosis, it was like a light that came to her understanding why she had so many other problems in her life, and finally she was able to explain it. Again, that's thanks to, to genetic testing. And so all these, these important features about genetic testing are now even better uh, that genetic testing processing is way faster than before. We can have results in four to six weeks sometimes, uh, and the majority of times about 10 to 12 weeks. And it's interesting because sometimes I tell the patient that we have to wait this amount of time, <laughs> and some of them are very disappointed and they don't remember that just a couple of years ago, uh, the waiting time was one year to receive results. And so we have made a lot of progress. Genetic testing is better, genetic testing is faster, and even better, it's sponsored by some programs. And I want to take just a few, few minutes just to say thank you to the Foundation for Fighting Blindness for supporting my retina tracker program. Certainly, they have changed uh, the way we, we are able to offer this testing to patients. They made it affordable and they helped us to advance the field. I worked at the University of Kentucky before, now at Duke University, and I don't think that I would have done the same work without the My Retina Tracker program. Great, thank you, Dr. Maldonado. Um, so I too just want to say a quick uh, thanks um, to, uh, for the invitation to come here today. Um, it's delightful to come to Visions. Um, so I, I want to second your point about how much genetic testing has improved. So I got into the field of retinal genetics, um, gosh, 17 years ago, and we had hardly anything to offer. <laughs> and it was, it was frustrating, and we had to depend on research studies or someone to have good enough insurance to get genetic testing. Um, so we really have come a long way. Um, and I used to talk to people and walk them through why we offer genetic testing, right? So we offer genetic testing to sometimes confirm a diagnosis, to try to give some natural history expectations or a prognosis. A lot of times we can't. Um, these folks have family members, right? Who else in the family could could potentially be at risk of uh, developing the same condition. And then the third reason is, um, while at that time we really had not a lot to hang our, our hats on for a hope um, for future treatments, um, we talked about the fact that it's like when you take your car in, you can't get it fixed unless you know it's not working well, and then you can start to, to, to develop a fix. And now not only has genetic testing is improved, but now we have hope with therapies as well. So now that's a real practical use of genetic testing is figuring out, do you qualify for clinical trials? Um, do you qualify for the one 
one FDA approved therapy that we have. Um, and there's hope for more. So my job as a genetic counselor is to make sure that you get the right test, that I walk you through the limitations and the benefits of genetic testing, okay? So when we have folks come to clinic, let's just take everybody with a retinal disorder, okay? Um, there's about a 60% chance that the common gene panel tests that are commonly offered and offered by the My Retina Tracker program will be able to identify the genetic cause for, um, for your uh, retinal condition, right? Um, there are certain diagnoses where that detection rate is higher, but if you take all comers to the clinic, right? Um, so I want you to know that up front because I want you to know there are actually three possible results we can get back from genetic testing. One is a positive result, and in genetics, that's an answer, okay? And an answer means different things, right? It, it tells me which gene isn't working. It should tell me how it's running in the family. Um, it might not tell me your important question. What does this look like for me in 5, 10, 15 years? We may not be able to give that amount of detail. Um, but certainly other family members could get tested if they wanted to to figure out if they are at risk or if they are carriers for an, you know, the genetic condition in the family. Um, so a negative result certainly doesn't mean there's not a retinal condition, right? Um, it could mean that we don't know the gene yet that's causing... Um, the condition in your family or in you. Um, it could also be that um, we don't have the technologies to detect it at this point, or it's sitting right in front of us and we don't understand it yet. So those are all possibilities that we talk about with the negative result. But on these gene panels, they're so big. Remember we talked about, you've heard hundreds of genes can cause um, problems with the retina. Most people actually don't get a negative result. They actually either get a positive result and or they get um, what we call variants of unknown significance. So we all have hundreds of thousands of different gene changes and uh, the laboratories don't understand all of them and we're working towards making better sense of those, but that's a possibility as well and sometimes people get a mix of positive and uncertain results. Um, as Dr. Maldonado was saying, the other aspect of genetic testing we talk about is a small number of people will be identified as having something more than just a retinal condition. It is part of a genetic, what we call syndrome, meaning there are multiple um, um, or systems of the body that could be um, in, involved. Um, we've, you've probably heard Usher syndrome a lot, right? So that is one, one example. But there are others um, that may be more of a surprise on, on this test. Most people do not, uh, but that is something we talk about too. And sometimes we actually identify carriers on genetic testing. But we are working towards trying to reduce the number of those uncertain results. And part of my work now is I'm privileged to work on a research consortium called ClinGen, which the foundation helps support now, where we are trying to make genetic testing more informative um, for uh, patients um, so that we can understand more of those variants of unknown significance that we hate, you hate, <laughs> um, and give more informative results. Um, so we appreciate the foundation's support in, in doing so. Um, so um, that's, we've come a long way. Um, to make genetic testing better. We're going to keep working on, on doing so, and the technology uh, for gene sequencing is getting better and better. So um, looking forward to getting even better at this. Thank you. Um, I'm Todd Durham. I'm with the Foundation Fighting Blindness. I want to share a little bit of information with you about my retina tracker um, program that Dr. Maldonado referred to. Uh, we have had a registry here at the foundation for many, many years, and it started out as a mailing list uh, that was designed to keep people up to date with what was going on in research. So it's been around for a long time. And um, in uh, 2017, we um, launched a, a genetic testing program uh, that Dr. Maldonado uh, alluded to. And the idea was if we could um, put 
the, uh, a person's um, phenotype or their presentation, the way the condition was presenting itself with their knowledge about their genotype, that is the genetic cause of the condition. We now um, understand more about the condition and we've also armed that individual with a new way to advocate for themselves, to go find research opportunities that were relevant to answer a question about um, what, what is making my vision loss, what's, what's causing this. And I think for many people, it has answered that very personal question so they can now begin to search for, for new um, opportunities for themselves in research. So our uh, My Retina Tracker program has been around since 2017. Um, this program has been wildly successful. It was uh, launched as a pilot program uh, as a, a nonprofit organization at that time. I wasn't here, but at that time we were not sure how exactly we would do such a program in a research setting. And um, today we've tested over 20,000 people with IRDs. And that is just amazing. And um, the, the number of people now who have answers, the number of clinicians who now have a better idea for how to inform their patients. And um, importantly, now we have more information to help individuals find research opportunities, which is one of the reasons why we have the registry. So if you're registered in my Retina Tracker registry, um, well, number one, you should understand this is a research study. It's not a fundraising vehicle. So this um, registry is managed by my team, and we're trained in privacy and data security. And we work with healthcare um, uh, individuals in healthcare who are also concerned about privacy of your health information. Um, but what we um, what we like to do is when we find a research opportunity that we think is relevant for you, based on what we understand about your profile, in uh, is contact you about that research opportunity, inform you of it, and um, tell you how you can take the next step. Yep. And uh, since 2020, just in the last four, year, four years alone, we've helped do that for 35 research studies, clinical trials, our own natural history studies. Oftentimes, labs are looking for individuals to donate biospecimens for um, cell studies. So we've um, in, really enabled a lot of research just in the last four years alone. And I wanted to mention, uh, because the Nixons are here, um, we, um, we and them partnered on a, a PRPH2 workshop and my retina tracker registry was, I think, I was, I was delighted to find out when I came to the PRPH2 workshop that many people were there be, only because they had received our letter about the workshop. And I just thought that really speaks to the reach that we, um, it, the, the registry is doing what we intended it to do. Uh, so I think that's uh, another illustration of its impact. And one thing I wanted to say, um, even if your, um, Christy mentioned the possible results from genetic testing, even if you don't have a clear answer, it's useful to be registered. We often have um, research partners who are interested in, in people with a clinical diagnosis of retinitis pigmentosa, and it's not relevant whether you ha understand the genetic cause or molecular cause of your condition. So that shouldn't be a barrier for you signing up. And the last thing I wanted to mention, there are probably a lot of people in our community um, who have undergone maybe several uh, clinical gene panel tests and still don't have a clear understanding of what's causing their condition. And one of our uh, exhibitors is with the Medical College of Wisconsin. This is fortuitous. They have a research program they're recruiting for now. Um, this is for people who have no negative results. That means nothing, no, no hits among the genes on the panel. Or those who have some, some indeterminate result where a more comprehensive whole genome or whole exome sequencing would be used useful. So I encourage you, there's no cost incurred to you. This is a research study that you could go speak with them about in the exhibit hall. So um, thank you. that's all I have for my prepared comments. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And I, and I just want to add um, a, a bit of commentary with regards to the null or not being able to identify um, the cause of disease. Um, in the research community, they've kind of dubbed this term elusive genes. And so this is really their inability to kind of pinpoint what that cause of disease is. And so the foundation has been um, investing in, in lots of research groups, and there are research groups around the globe that's really exploring, um, you know, kind of turning over the, the genome left and right to figure out 
where are some new places to begin to think about um, those causes of disease. And in fact, they've been successful in, in, in many cases in finding um, you know, these, these genetic changes in places that they hadn't been look, look, looking at before. And so they can take that knowledge and then begin to expand uh, the number of uh, genes that are in these gene testing panels. So it, even from the research side of the house, I mean, the, we're, a lot of researchers are working to, to kind of close the gap on, on those null or elusive genes. Um, I wanted to also just ask, ask the panel before we open up the floor uh, for questions, one of the things that come up um, is the difference between a clinical um, diagnosis and a molecular diagnosis. Dr. Maldonado, would you maybe like to clarify? Yeah, sure. Um, I, I think that it's important to remark that uh, phenotyping these diseases or characterizing these diseases in a clinical way, it requires the use of technologies um, like uh, specialized imaging or electrophysiology. And so I think that a thorough evaluation done at a place that it's familiar with inherited retinal diseases is very important. And so we do every effort to characterize in the best way this uh, retinal condition that the patient has. And that is what it gives us a clinical diagnosis there. Uh, but again, uh, obtaining a molecular diagnosis is a lot different. And it's essentially uh, going um, deeper into this classification there. And the classic example is retinitis pigmentosa, a huge umbrella term. So many types of retinitis pigmentosa associated to so many genes. And so classifying them by the genes, obtaining that molecular diagnosis is another level that helps the patient to get into clinical trials, helps the patient to know about the prognosis. But the interesting thing, and this is what I like to mention to fellows or residents, is that I, I think that we are moving also a little bit beyond that gene classification. And in a few more years, we will be talking about the variants. And not only about the gene, but where in the gene is the variant. We used to call it mutations, now we, we like to call it variants. So that is what we uh, call molecular diagnosis, and that is what eventually is going to get us to that beautiful term that it's called precision medicine where we can uh, do more interventions based on where is the variant affecting the patient. Okay, thank you. Um, and, and Todd, just thinking about my retina tracker registry, I mean, we think about it as, you know, patients having their data there, and it's a way to communicate, um, as you mentioned, workshops that we have so that you're informed, or if there's clinical trials uh, that are available, sponsors can, can, can use it as a vehicle for that communication. But maybe share some of the other activities, like the questionnaires that having the, the registry has, has been helpful for as well. Yeah, so we um, we have our own data collection modules that we um, have as a part of a separate research study, and um, one of them is uh, it's been an instrument developed by the the, the NIH, um, and it's focused on physical and mental health. And we put that included that in the registry because we think we know that uh, mental health, anxiety, depression is a big part of life with inherited retinal disease, and we wanted to have a way to capture that. Um, study it and so we can report on it. Um, so we have a, a formal tool to collect on that. And um, many of our um if you're registered in the registry, you also know we are asking questions about do you use assistive devices? When did you first have visual symptoms? While these aren't clinical tests that Dr. Maldonado might do, they can give us a clue as to uh, where a person is at a certain age. So uh, we ask, um, <laughs> the doctors don't like us asking this, um, do you still drive some of the time? <laughs> um, because yeah, your Dr. Maldonado might think that you shouldn't drive, 
um, but you still do. Um, so, um, but, we, but we know that's important to affected individuals, the ability to drive and drive safely. So we ask about that, and it can inform about the long-term uh, prognosis for conditions, what activities you're still able to, able to engage in. And we, we also uh, understand well when we ask questions that sometimes they're not fun to answer that you can or can't do certain things. So we are, we are cognizant of that. And we, um, we have plans to implement new patient-reported outcomes Outcome measures in this next year um, developed by colleagues at uh, Michigan, yep. University of Michigan. Thank you. Um, Christy, I, I, we had a question earlier this week. We were uh, holding a board meeting, and it was really about when um, there are new genes that are identified um, in other countries. How is that, that data made known to the broader community that there's this new variant, um, the new term that Dr. Maldonado introduced? Can you talk a little bit about um, the global aspect of genetic testing and information sharing? Yeah, sure. Um, so there are a few different ways. Um, one is through publications. Um, so publishing uh, a case report to um, a journal that um, you would expect clinicians or researchers to follow uh, would be a good way to do that. Um, there are also some programs, um, one of which is called Gene Matcher. Um, and so Gene Matcher um, has been terribly helpful in um, gathering enough cases in order to make substantial um, gene disease relationships known. Um, so if um, in our re on research testing we found a gene variant in this specific gene, but we had not seen it reported as being a, a, a retinal gene that causes um, dystrophy, um, we could actually put um, this variant in this gene, in this gene tracker, and anyone who would also put that same same uh, gene and, and that gene matcher would get notified. We'd all get notified and then we get to talk to each other and you can um, share some limited information, whatever you signed the consent form to al allow us to share. Um, and a lot of times we can make those connections that way. Um, so um, I, generally at this point with new gene discoveries, we're, we're finding them through um, medical literature, but also um, we attend um, conferences. Um, Dr. Maldonado, I'm sure you were there too. To, and I know Dr. Lester was there um, at um, the Arvo meeting back in uh, in May, where we can talk to colleagues and network and say, "Hey, I'm working on this, found a new gene that's of interest," and so we can actually um, share that information um, uh, through presentations at these meetings as well. Um, and then someone says, "Oh, I've got a case too," and then you can put those cases together. Just having one family often is not enough unless you have many generations and lots of people that have the condition. Um, so those are ways in which we can sort of build cases uh, for new gene disease relationships. Thank you. So I'm going to open up the floor because I know you all have questions um, for our panelists. Um, so we have mic runners, so just as a reminder, because we're recording the session, uh, wait till the microphone uh, comes to you and then you can ask your question into the microphone. Um, and I'm calling my mic runners early, so they're, they're getting situated. <laughs> And they're coming out. We have a couple of hands to the right side of the stage. Behind you, coming in. No, it should be on. There you go. Uh, thanks for taking my question. Uh, about 15 years ago, uh, my son was diagnosed with RP by his retinal specialist at University of Iowa. And they um, took some skin and maybe some blood too, and we got a report from them that said, this gene may be causative. It was very iffy. So then um, 
later, maybe about seven years ago, they said we'd like to test, test it again. And after quite a long time, more than the weeks you're talking about, <laughs> um, the same lab told us that there was a replication of CRB1 that, that, that they thought was responsible. And my question is, if this was all done through the clinic, is, is there anything to be gained from using my retina tracker to do the same testing to determine the responsible gene? Uh, I, this is Todd Durham. <clears throat> I don't know about the other lab, but the, the labs that we use for our program are CLIA certified, which means they're good for medical diagnostics, so they have to have a certain uh, accreditation to be used in medicine. So um, these are large commercial labs. I don't know, Dr. Maldonado, Christy, if you have any comments in particular on CRB1 or... I mean, in general, I like to tell my patients that uh, the results that we bring up from genetic testing are based on a build of knowledge that happens throughout the years. And frequently, when a patient has a negative result, we tend to repeat it, at least when it has been three years from the last genetic testing. And the reason for that is that uh, we keep collecting new information about more patients, about more results, and so the databases are better uh, every time. As we, and um, so when you don't have a, a conclusive result, it makes sense to repeat one. And the other one is that uh, laboratories are different. Uh, some are better than others or have a better panel than others, and Christy can expand on that. But some cover more genes than others. Others, they are better at certain genes. Uh, others are better at some uh, intronic regions in the known coding regions. So there are chances that sometimes I, uh, doing more testing and help the patient to get that uh, result that they are looking for. So you give the opportunity, and thank you for this, to sort of make a distinction between research testing and clinical testing. So even if you're seeing, being seen in a clinic, you may be offered research testing, and research testing can take infinite time. <laughs> it can take a long time. There's no usually set turnaround time, right? I suspect that at least in the earlier days, that's what you all participated in. Um, and often, um, as Dr. Durham was alluding to, those aren't results that can go into your medical record. And so those aren't results that Dr. Maldonado can make decisions on. They may not be results that would qualify you for a clinical trial. So sometimes um, if we do have a suspicion because of a research study that this is the answer, sometimes it is a good idea to get that confirmed in a clinical CLIA-approved laboratory. So those results can be put into the electronic health record. Um, so um, there are some research studies that do offer um, clinical testing as part of their, um, their research study. So it's just best to talk with, um, if you have a genetic counselor involved, um, they would be able to tell you, is this worth repeating, um, or uh, your retina specialist or other, other provider. Um, and I should also say, you can be in my retina tracker without doing the genetic testing. So if you've had genetic testing and you don't want to make the foundation pay for more genetic testing, which is probably good. You can still participate and you can still be contacted if you qualify for any of the trials. So I say there's not much to lose um, to pr participating. Um, and then you actually can, uh, just like the name suggests, you can track uh, vision over time. Um, so that's, that's a distinction that is very difficult um, for a lot of people to make that distinction because we are probably not the you know, always the best at making that clear. Clear um, clinical testing is is more like what the ret my retina tracker is doing now with the sponsored testing. Um, so that helps. Thank you, Dan. Uh, yeah, hi. Uh, this is Dan Day from Orlando. Um, 
So I have a question for clarification under the new uh, My Retina tracker that we're, we're rolling out now, uh, specifically about uh, it, it, because as a chapter president, I get questions fairly often and kind of spread the word about no cost genetic testing and counseling about who should make the clinical diagnosis before they, to, it, to, so that they can order the, the molecular diagnosis. And um, so I guess my specific question is uh, it, virtually any eye care professional can make the clinical diagnosis. In other words, you know, for example, if an optometrist sees an OCT scan and suspects it's an IRD, uh, that's sufficient to order the, the no-cost genetic testing, or should it be a retina specialist that actually does the diagnosis? And I guess that's what I'm asking for is clarification as to who's qualified to, to basically say, yeah, this, this needs a molecular diagnosis. Uh, thanks for the question, Dan. Um, try not to get in trouble here. Um, there are a lot. There are a lot of opinions in the healthcare community about who should, who can, and should make a diagnosis. Currently, the program is is more open, um, so that if a provider in the U.S. is allowed in their state to order a diagnostic test, then they can order through our program. So it is an open, is more open program in that way. But we could have a lot of debates and arm wrestling over how we would decide what kind of provider is in the best position to make the diagnosis. I, I will say um, the genetic testing for these large gene panels is very difficult to interpret in many cases. And so I have my genetic colleagues reach out to me that work at, at my hospital sometimes who are seeing cases and ask me my opinion on their patient's genetic result. So if it's not your area of expertise, um, and genetic, if genetic testing is not something you regularly order, um, these are somewhat difficult tests to interpret sometimes because a lot of times there's five or six variants that are listed on your lab report. What do they all mean? Most of them have nothing to do with why you had the test, right? So it, it helps to um, have a trained professional um, in genetics or an IRD specialist like Dr. Maldonado who has focused on genetics to help interpret those results for you. Unfortunately, the Foundation Fighting Blindness has factored that in into the Maya Retina Tracker program and uh, allowed funding to have, everyone can have access to a genetic counselor, um, be it virtual or in person, um, to help interpret those results um, because they can be tricky sometimes. I guess. Uh, if I can say one more thing uh, to add on to that, I mean, I think that the main message we want to take is that uh, the provider that's getting the genetic testing, uh, we, we should um, ed educate those providers that it's important to link the patient to someone that is specialized in the field. So it's okay if they are going to get the genetic testing, but it will be, in my opinion, incorrect to just not take the next step, which is providing, uh, uh, connecting the patient with someone that will provide genetic counseling and that will provide the next steps in the chain of diagnosis and management of the condition. Okay, it's Martin from North Carolina. Um, I registered for Retina Tracker maybe 10 years ago, and I don't think I've ever updated it. So what are the best practices for updating your information in Retina Tracker, and how quickly does the data go stale? Um, thanks, Martin. This is Todd. The, um, yeah, it will be number one. It, we, we want, we hope people will update their contact information, most importantly, and their genetic information. Uh, make sure it's up to date. If sometimes people will get an update on their lab report, sometimes they don't think about that. But your contact information is the number one important one. If we don't have an up, uh, up to date email address, we can't find you at all. Um, that's the most important part, Martin, and if um, I also say if anyone, we have a staff, if um, we have modern security features just like every other website, sometimes people grumble because they have to enter a new PIN number and a new password reset. So we are not, we cannot escape that um, being a research study. Um, but if, if you ever have any difficulties managing the site, we have staff who are happy to help. But maintaining your contact information is the most important. 
Okay. Jen. Hi, my name is Maureen, and Joan and I represent a foundation that has given a grant to my retina tracker. I uh, wanted to just thank you all for all of the work you've done and the acknowledgement of all of the organizations that have been here today for the funding that they've received from Foundation Fighting Blindness. Our question is this, um, how do you make decisions, and I guess this would go to Dr. Durham, how do you make decisions regarding which research project Projects, efforts you decide to fund through FFB? Ah, uh, so I'm going to answer a different question. Um, <laughs> mostly because the person who can best answer that particular question is right here, Amy Laster. Um, so I was going to answer a different question, which is um, through my retina tracker, who do we decide to work with? Who do we collaborate with? We collaborate with academic researchers, nonprofits, industry companies. Um, as long as it is bona fide research, we, I can't think of an occasion where we, we have not decided that we would collaborate with them. Um, as long as it's adding to our mission, well, we would not, we would not uh, collaborate with someone who was doing a clinical trial and had not um, gotten in institutional or IRB approval of their recruitment materials. That's an absolute must as far as we're concerned. So I can't can't think of an instance where someone has wanted to work with us and we wouldn't have found a way to work to work with them on, on uh, research as a collaborator. Um, but Amy, that, I think um, she's asking a different question is hey, how do we decide who to fund? Yeah, thank you uh, for the question. So uh, the foundation, uh, our mission is to drive research. So we absolutely uh, fund clinical and um, research. And there are two kind of areas that are our research priority. So there's just what we call basic science, and that's things like understanding disease, understanding um, what's you know happening in, in, in when your retinal specialist uh, sees you in the clinic and how that correlates with the disease. How do you image um, you know, the different phases of, of disease and, and monitor the progression, as well as genetics, right? So we, as I mentioned earlier, there's this elusive genes kind of category. So we fund researchers to try to identify those elusive genes or variants of unknown significance as uh, Miss Lee pointed out earlier. And then there's another um, kind of side of, of research funding that we have, and that's on therapeutic approaches. So many of you have sat in some sessions today, whether it was on optogenetics or emerging uh, therapies or uh, stem cell or cell-based therapies. And so that's an area of priority that the foundation funds. How do we get there? We have an amazing, awesome, stellar scientific and advisory board. It's over 60 clinicians and scientists around the world who have expertise in all of these areas um, that, that drives our mission. And so they are really the ones who help us to decide the research proposals that come in for funding, um, which ones have the greatest potential for success and aligns with the mission of the foundation. And so they make recommendations to us um, for, for those fundings and, and help guide us. They even help guide us in what should be our priority. So every five years, we establish a five-year science strategic plan. And within that plan, we really lay out what's possible for us to accomplish. At the end of the day, our mission is for um, the, the spectrum of retinal disease. So it's not a, a kind of priority of, of this particular disease or this particular gene, but it's how can we help the most most um, individuals um, as possible and, and address research for as many genes and diseases as possible. Thank you for that question. Thanks so much. It's great. Mm -hmm. I have another Hi. question. My name is Shannon Wallace, and I, my question is for Todd about my retina tracker. I believe I signed up four years ago, and my question is, is are we, should we be receiving an email once a year that says, hey, you're still registered? And if not, could we? Uh, thank you for the question. Um, we, w one thing we try to limit things that we don't think will be important to, to you. So if, for example, if you told us that your level of vision was light perception only, 
Um, I'm not going to send you an email about a gene therapy trial for which you wouldn't be eligible anyway. So we try to minimize distracting emails. Um, we ha in the past, we have sent out some fairly large distributions that we thought were relevant to a large community. Um, we are encountering today, like, um, I don't know how if any of you work in, in mass marketing, but the your whoever pri handles your in-mail, your inbox, Google, Yahoo, if you're still using AOL, they all have have filters now and we are seeing challenges now for whatever mails we send out we're getting a lot of bounce backs even though if we were to send you a single mail from my address uh, you might go through your whatever your filter is so we are we are encountering some problems with that um, but it's a great suggestion if we can circ circumvent whatever the the servers the email servers are doing with the larger emails, yes, I think is a great idea, and it had been our intent uh, and our practice to send out an email that we thought was relevant to a large population, because we learn if your email bounce back, bounces back, we now have an opportunity to update your, your email address. So that had been our practice until most recently when we were starting to get a lot of um, bounce backs. Okay. Another question over here. Hi, th thanks so much uh, for the, the great information. My name's Harris, I'm from Washington, D.C. And um, my apologies, I didn't have a chance to go to all the excellent uh, sessions, uh, scientific sessions, uh, to see some of the breakthroughs or hear them talk about it. So are you saying that uh, they're now able to identify, say, this gene that is not producing this protein, and then they know because this gene isn't producing this protein that that is causing the loss of acuity or field division or contrast for this person with RP. Uh, and then as the corollary to that, they actually reach the uh, point where you're going in with tools like CRISPR or other of these things to repair that gene, and they've actually seen by repairing that gene that some vision is coming back. Is there any, is that, have we gone that far yet? I mean, I, I think that uh, we have made a lot of progress, and in the field of gene therapy, we have, uh, as you know, different ways to do this genetic therapy, replacing the gene, modifying uh, the translation of the DNA with RNA, doing editing with CRISPR-Cas. There are many ways to, to do genetic therapy. But uh, honestly, I think that uh, genetic therapy is not going to be the unique fix. And certainly, there's much more going on there than the DNA defect. And in reality, in my vision, I think that we are going to need gene therapy, gene therapy plus something else. For example, we know that there are macrophages, white blood cells in the retina that are extremely activated in these retinal degenerations. So we need to control them as well in, in addition to fixing the DNA problem. So the permanent fix is uh, more complex than gene therapy, but uh, we are certainly making a huge, huge progress over the last five years. Thank you. Thank you. And, and when you're talking about the, the macrophages uh, in the eye, that's the, the, the things that trigger like inflammation. And so there is some treatments for inflammation that can happen, that does happen. Is that just during disease or during treatment? Yeah, so it, it's a field that where we need to learn a lot still. Uh, in general, I can tell you that there are good and bad white blood cells or rescue cells there. So there's the process of degeneration happening affecting the cells and there is debris essentially cells that are dead activating these uh, inflammatory cascade and there's the bad inflammation too much inflammation created by these bad white blood cells but there are also other good white blood cells called microglia that actually help to clean up the debris, the dead cells, and they have a protective role in the retina. So um, enhancing the function of the microglia would be a, a, one of the um, good ways to tackle uh, the, uh, to halt the retinal degeneration, if you can say. 
And so, yeah, it is a little bit more complex. So just doing a steroids, for example, wouldn't, wouldn't be a, a permanent fix. We have to selectively uh, address this inflammation, uh, enhance the good inflammation, and uh, decrease the bad inflammation. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? I mean, if, if I can say one thing, I just want to take two minutes because of the question of, of how the foundation uh, supports research. And, uh, and um, I want to take the chance to, again, thank the Foundation for Fighting Blindness. Uh, two years ago, I got a grant from the foundation um, and, uh, to develop a technology that is going to help to diagnose these diseases in children. Most of the technology that we have is set for adults. But kids, they move, they, they don't look at the light, they have nystagmus, it, it is uh, very difficult to get good, uh, good scans of the retina. So we have designed a, a device that is faster, it's high resolution, and we're testing it. Uh, but thanks to the grant that I got from the Foundation for Fighting Blindness is that I have been able to hire some postdocs, I have been able to sustain a, a program that is helping us to advance that field of early diagnosis. So the, the touch that the Foundation for Fighting Blindness has done in, in my program is, is uh, tremendous, and I'm very thankful for that. Huh? Yeah, and the, the gene therapies that we have and are developing will be best in as, as early as we can diagnose these. So all you know, research works hand in hand. Um, absolutely, well. absolutely, yeah. The earlier, the better. The earlier the diagnosis, the better chances we have to control the the inflammatory response and the degeneration. Yeah. We have another question up front. Uh, hi, it's Dan Day again, um, and then, again, thanks for the information today, it's very helpful. I wanted to make, I guess, what's kind of an editorial comment here, and then ask you to comment on that, but um, I talk to people every so often, and I talk to them about no-cost genetic testing, and, you know, oh, this is exciting, you can get something that's normally very expensive, it won't cost you anything, and there's a fair number of people that are like, oh, well, you know, I'm not all that interested, I, you know, I'll, I'll wait when the FDA approves something, you know, they're just, just really not all that excited about getting tested and I'm thinking that even if you're not excited for yourself about getting genetically tested right now uh, the more people we have in that database the more phenotypes genotypes that can be in there for researchers to look at I think that generally helps the scientific community quite a lot so we want that database to be as complete as possible so that that's my comment and I didn't you know invite folks to say whether I'm I'm out to lunch here or whether <laughs> Well, I would love to take a first stab at that. So there are different reasons for different people not wanting to do genetic testing. And what I found in practice is that it often correlated with where folks were in the diagnostic process. So some people that were early in the diagnostic process are really um, were just referred because when they went to get their contacts fitted, someone saw something they didn't like and sent them to the retina specialist. And my, what I got away from those conversations were that people weren't ready for something that was going to confirm that this was a retinal dystrophy um, that could be progressive, and they just weren't ready for that confirmation. So sometimes it's a timing thing, and I had the privilege of seeing people over the years. I had people decline, um, and, and my job is basically to offer it to you and give you the information. It's not to talk you into it, right? So if you want it, great. If you don't, that, that's okay with me too. Um, but I did find that over the years, sometimes people would come back and they'd say, oh yeah, I want that genetic test, because then they had sort of had, you know, enough time for it to soak in, and they had maybe owned the, the realization that, you know, th this, is, this is real, and maybe I do want to be informed. Um, 
I think another reason why people don't necessarily want to participate in genetic testing is that there's a lot of distrust, um, especially in some minority populations um, where um, they're not comfortable giving a blood sample to do genetic testing. Maybe there's not trust that they're only going to look at the retina genes. What else are they looking at? Who are they sharing it with? And you know, you all know some of these direct-to-consumer companies like you know 23andMe and Ancestry.com, they sell genetic information, right? That's part of what you sign up to do. And so some people just aren't comfortable with that. And knowing that most of the time we do not have a specific therapy for the gene that's probably causing your form, um, there's not as much incentive um, for some people. So to each its own, my job is to present the information and help you make the decision that's best for you. But yeah, there are there are some different reasons why people choose not to. Um, you know, and, and a lot of people are altruistic and they do do it for the reasons you're talking about, um, just to help the future. It may not help me, but it'll help somebody else and that's good enough for me, sign me up. So that is a very popular reason for doing the test. Yeah, I agree with that, Dan, because <clears throat> Um, the variants of uncertain significance are uncertain because we haven't seen enough of those cases yet. Yeah. So to upgrade a variant of uncertain significance, a likely path or path, you need more cases. So how do we get cases? We have people tested and have them cataloged, curated, and documented. So it is very much uh, an objective of ours is to improve the diagnostic yield of these panels and to make those VUSs now something more clear cut in the future. Yeah, that's my job, to help them go away. <laughs> and we have a, a hand up. We're getting a mic runner to you now. Hi, so I had the genetic testing through the foundation in 2018 at the Kellogg Eye Center in Detroit. And um, while they did not expect to find a match, they did. And um, the gene that I have the mutation on is the NRL gene. So my question is twofold. One, does that information automatically go into the retina tracker if I had previously registered? Uh, yeah, this is Todd. Yes, we are in. We are in the process right now of bringing those records. They came through the Blueprint program. We are in the process this summer of bringing those into your profile, and you should get an email to say that your test results are now available in your account. Okay, I have not got that yet, but I'll watch for it. I'm guessing my question is now threefold. Sorry. <laughs> part Part two is uh, the genetic counselor asked my parents to also submit blood work in order to confirm, I guess, that a recessive gene came from the both of them. Yeah. So they did that, but had not heard anything back and had trouble connecting. Uh, what's your recommendation? Do we keep following up with them, or is that very important or not really? Yeah, good question. So when we do genetic testing, um, we are typically looking at both copies of a gene, um, except for the, the genes on the X chromosome and the Y chromosome, you should have two copies of, of each gene. And of course, um, folks who are assigned female at birth would have two copies of the genes on the X chromosome too, right? But when we're doing the genetic testing, we can't tell, um, we can't, we can find two genetic changes, but we can't tell whether they're both in the same copy of the gene that you got from one parent, or whether you inherited one of those genetic variants from mom and one of those genetic variants from dad. And when we're talking about recessive conditions, um, what we need to, what we expect to see um, to confirm a diagnosis is that both copies of the gene have a gene variant causing them not to work well. And so basically your genetic counselor wanted to make sure that you inherited one of the variants from your mom and one of the variants from your dad so that they could establish what we call phase. To, to confirm that yes, this does look like a, re a recessive form. Because if you had both variants in uh, a copy inherited from, say, your mom, then 
you know, as far as our genetic test shows, your other copy uh, looks okay, um, and that doesn't give us a confirmed answer. Um, so that's why. Um, sometimes, um, I, I don't know how the, this was done through my retina checker, I'm supposing the, the parental testing, or testing for parents. Um, so I don't know what the, what the practice is. Uh, a lot of times the information is more for you instead of your, your parents. Um, but I would recommend getting back in touch with your genetic counselor. I think that's probably the best point of contact and see if, um, if you can get some direction. And it may be that you're, I don't think they would require your parents to call, but that, anyways, they should be able to give you some next steps. Okay, thank you. And yeah. my, then my third part is, since this NRL gene seems very rare, um, I have yet in the five years, six years that I've known about it, to have heard of any other person that has the same mutation. And you mentioned maybe somehow being able to make some connections through the retina tracker or some other way. Do you have any suggestions of how that could possibly happen? I'd just be curious to yeah. You know. So my retina tracker, I think, is a great tool. Um, there's something that the the ClinGen Consortium, the research group that I work on, um, may be able to help as well. Um, it's called Genome Connect. Um, and this is a program where actually you all can help us learn more about your variants. Um, it's a registry similar to my retina tracker, and you obviously can do both, right? It's free. Um, but you upload your genetic test results, okay? And you fill out a full body survey to so ask you questions about, um, you know, more than just your, your eye. Um, but anyways, it'll upload, uh, you upload your genetic test result. Um, and you can actually opt to be put in contact with other people who may share gene variants in your same gene. Now, in order for this to work for you personally, there has to be another person in that registry right with your gene. But that's just another way that you can um, reach out. Um, it actually um, helps science, too, because there may have been some other gene variants on there on your report that your information can kind of help us vet those variants as well. So um, we use it as a tool to help take some of those gene variants we don't understand and learn more about them as well. Thank but you. Can you repeat that name? Yeah, Genome Connect. Okay, um, thank so you. So I think if you Google that, it'll probably pop up first, but it's through the ClinGen, and you can Google ClinGen. I know that'll come up first. So that's C-L-I-N-G-E-N. Um, but Genome Connect is the patient registry. And anyone who's had genetic testing can sign up. I will also say, um, if, you, um, if your um, gene variant does change classifications, they will actually alert you to contact your genetic counselor or whoever ordered the test, so you can be updated on what your variant is now called. So if it went from uncertain to now, we're going to say it's likely pathogenic, which means there's a 90% uh, certainty that this is is um, causing uh, an issue for your gene, um, they'll actually contact you and say, cont they won't tell you what the change is, but they'll say contact your um, provider to get more information. So that's a nice tool as well if you've got some variants or you had an inconclusive result to get and stay on top of updates. Um, so just, just another, another idea. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to uh, say thank you to our panelists, Todd, Christy, and uh, Romero. We're at time. This has been an extremely informative panel, so thank you very much for sharing. Um, and, and please join me in, in thanking them with a round of applause.